Okay. We, as usual, we have a lot to cover today, especially regarding project number three, because uh, project number three, as you would all already are aware of, we're gonna, uh, you're going to uh, write a vision, fine, fine tuning a vision large language model uh, multi or multimodal large language model. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit, but there are other things to cover in terms of image text multimodal learning. So I think we should get started then. Okay, so still a little bit late, and I'm going to have to mute everybody. All right, let's get to it. So welcome to the last week of AI 504. And um, things have changed a little bit because so last, last things are changing so fast in AI. So I'm going to change a little significantly uh, the content of, of this of this class from last year. So last year we talked about image to text, show ten, show tail, show and tail. Show tend and tell, and then text to image, um, you know, GAN based text to image uh, generation, or DALI one, and then bird based models like uh, Vilbert or or uh, Interbird or Uniter and that kind of stuff. But I'm going to skip a lot of that. So um, I'm going to skip show and tell. Just going to talk about show attend and tell very briefly, and then talk about clip and DALI two. So this week's practice will be about implementing clip and um, not DALI2, but um, classifier-free guidance diffusion model, kind of like DALI2 style, but not without the upsampling. I'm gonna, we're we're going to talk about that. And then very briefly touch upon bird-based models. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, depending on the time, because I have to leave at 12 o'clock sharp today. So, And then this will be the, the important part of, uh, of today's class. All right, let's go. Let's get to it then. So the very first thing is image text or image captioning. And obviously everybody should know what image captioning is. So image cap is a, image text is a sequence to see, kind of like a sequence to sequence, but rather more like an image to sequence. So we've all talked about sequence to sequence many, many times in our RNN and attention and transformer class. Sequence to sequence is basically text in and text out, such as translation from French to English. Image to sequence is obviously image in and text down. So it's kind of like describing a given image in text. So this is kind of like this. So given an image, we want to generate text like this or like this or like this, right? So it's image caption generation. And the inc we since this is an image to text, we're going to use an encoder decoder architecture where the encoder is a CNN. And decoders are in this. So we're, we're talking about very old technique from 2015, I think. So show attend and tell is kind of like the first model, the first image caption generation of, um, algorithm that uses attention mechanism. So there was a show, show and tell before that, but then there came show attend and tell afterwards. So it's a one with the attention. So when sequence sequence, the text-based sequence sequence, both encoder and decoder use RNN, but here we use CNN as an image encoder and RNN as a text decoder, right? So yeah, as I said, show attend and tell is came out in 2015, very, you know, in the early days of deep learning, so to speak. And it's mixing attention with image captioning. So this was the very, I'm not sure if it's the first, but it's at least the first well-known paper to do so. And what we would like to do Actually, let's skip this. What we would like to do is this. So, example, a bird. So there's there's a there's a an image, and we want to give this image to a model, and then generate a this text like this: a bird flying over a body of water. So, here you can see that at each time generating a single token, you know, just like this is a when you're decoding a image caption, you are generating one token at a time autoregressively, right? It's the same as sequence to sequence. It's just that the encoder has changed from RNN to the to CNN. So when you're generating the caption, you need to generate it one token at a time, obviously. And each time generating the token, you can see that the attention is attention distribution over the image is changing. So when you're talking about bird or, or flying, you can see that the image is highlighted around the bird itself and a body of water. So when it's generating the word water, the image, the, the attention distribu distribution over the image is a, a very, very much, very much different from here. So here, the, the attention is being focused on, on the bird, but here 
the attention is focused on, I guess, like distributed over the body of water itself right here. So you can see, we, we want to see this kind of behavior. And then there's a soft attention here. This is the soft, the first line is soft attention. This one's hard attention, but we're going to talk about soft, soft attention only. Yeah, the model is attending to relevant part of image when generating each word. So how do we do this? So if you think about how we implemented sequence to sequence with attention, so here, this is the encoder, the text encoder from, from the sequence to sequence. So the French word is already there. So there's H1, H3, H4. And then there's in, there's a English decoder when where you each time step generate a single word, you attend to all the words in the encoder side, right? So that that you so you generate a context vector for this particular time step too. So there's C2 here, and then there's previous Y1 head, which came out from here, right? It's an autoregressive model. There's context vector, and then based on these two, uh, actually three. So S1, previous hidden layer, the, uh, the current, current input, and the context vector, based on these three, you generate the current time step output Y2 head. So that was sequence sequence with attention. So in image captioning, what we need is an encoder to obtain, obtain image representation, a decoder to generate caption, and attention module. So this is a uh, show attend and tell uses, uses an attention mechanism. So you obviously need an attention module or attention function, so to speak, to calculate the attention weight. So for each component, we're going to use these models. So for encoder, we're going to use VGGNet. And for decoder, we're going to use LSTM. And for attention module, we can use ML, simple MLP, just like in the, just like when we what we did with uh, sequence to sequence text based model. So if you remember the convolution, the 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 principle, the, the the inner workings of convolution convolution neural network, there is a image, and then you convolve over it, and then you do it multiple times, and then you your actually your um, your output feature map shrinks from 32 to 28 to 24. If you if you don't use padding, if you do use padding to keep the uh, keep the dimension L, you can keep it keep going with 32 by 32 by 32, and, you know, all, all the way, all the way. But here we're assuming that we're not using padding. So uh, the feature map is shrinking as we go up the up the layer. And if you remember, as we go up to the layer, if we as we move up the ladder, the, the receptive field the size of the receptive field increases. So for the very the first here, the first in the first layer, the filter can only look at nine pixels, but that is now shrinked that 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 is represented in a single pixel in the next layer, and then the next layer, and then the next layer. So the final layer in the third layer, the single a single pixel or single feature map, single feature map or single feature can look at this amount of pixels like what is this like seven by seven like so it the receptive field gets larger and larger right so in vgg vgnet the vgg 16 which is the which we, we will use as an encoder for the image caption generation model this is how how it looks like the vgg net so there's like conv con conv pull conv conv pull so there's like re repetition of like components here so out of all these layer out of all these layer we're going to take the output from this particular layer. So after going through all the layers here, of, right after this layer, right after this this three by three convolution with 512 12 filters, output of this layer happens to have a image size or a feature map size of 14 by 14 by 512. So probably we started with what? We started with maybe 256, no, actually, probably not, like 128 or maybe 32. I'm not really sure what we started with, but let's say that we started with 32 by 32, 32 by 32. And then after all these layers, the output of this particular layer will have a 14 by 14 by 512 output feature map. And when you, when you flatten this, when you flatten the height and width, the, the 2D structure, we get 196 by 512 image representation vectors. So... This is what I'm talking about. After, after this layer, after this layer, what we get is this, this specific output feature map. So it's 14 by 14 by 512, right? And when we flatten this, when we flatten the 2D structure into a 1D structure, 
then we get this. So it's just simply just 14 times 14 is the 196, right? So the very first fiber here, there's like there's this this vector, right? There's vector here, which will be the first vector out of 196. And there's another vector here, which will be the last vector out of all 196 vectors. So if you flatten it, then you get this particular image here, which this fiber or this vector is A1 and this vector is A96, right? So it's basically you're just destroying the 2D structure of the image because the images are spatial. Image has Images have spatial information, but now since you flatten it, there's no longer the spatial, spatial information is kind of like destroyed here. So using this, what we do is each yi, when predicting, when predicting each yi, instead of attending to the encoder's output from the text encoder in RNN, we are attending to the fibers. Out of 196, there's one, 196 vectors here. Out of all that, so we calculate the attention distribution over the 196 feature maps or image fibers, basically. And then we use that as a context vector, and then the rest is the same. When we're predicting Y2, we use three components, three variables, which is H1, C2, and Y1, which is the previous output, and then we generate Y2, and that's it. So it's pretty simple. In, in today's standards, obviously, today's standards, it's just basically you are replacing the hidden layers of the RNN encoder to the feature maps of the image encoder. And that is it. Right, so the mathematical uh, the equations are like this, but it's, it's more or less the same, actually. There's, uh, there's here the MLP part where, so this is the MLP or the attention module where you calculate the, the, the affinity or the compatibility between the, uh, the fiber, each fiber is here. So there's one fiber, a j, a j fiber, and the previous uh, hidden layer from the decoder. So you just calculate the affinity between the two. And if, if, they are the, if their affinity score is high, it will get a high attention. If their affinity score is low, they'll get a low attention. And that's it, All right? So far, so good, right? So this is a very first technique to implement an image caption generation model. And these days, obviously, obviously, you know, GPT-4 can generate image captions. You can just, you know, like upload an image to GPT-4, and then you can ask things about GPT-4, like describe this image, and then the GPT-4 will describe the contents of the image. So it's very different from these days, but this is one of the very first old models to do this. So conceptually, it's good to know this kind of stuff. And actually, if, uh, I think last, until, up until last year, the practice session of this week was to implement show attendant panel, but obviously this 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 semester we're going to change that to clip and classifier guided diffusion. Uh, sorry, classifier free guided diffusion model. Right. So there are yeah some techniques technical details, but uh, yeah we 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 can we can skip this. These are uh, we're not going to implement this, and I don't think anybody will actually implement this ever since we live in twenty twenty three. So if you're interested, you can take take a look. If you're if you want to work on work on this model on your own time, you, you should pay attention to some of the technical details. And model performance, yeah, we can skip this as well. Some of the examples. So here, this is the image, and this is the generated caption. A woman is throwing a frisbee in a in a park, and this part, this word, the one with the uh, under underscore, frisbee. When the model was generating the word frisbee, this was its attention distribution. You can see that it is actually attending to the frisbee itself. So it's pretty, you know. So the grounding is becoming a, a thing here. So the model knows which part of pixel or which pixel pattern um, can is a, a, is mapped to which word, or actually the other way, which word. Which word is mapped to which kind of pixel pixel patterns or pi pixel patterns basically? So a frisbee, for example, a word frisbee, it typically typically means this kind of object, and a dog means this kind of object, and stop sign typically means this kind of object. So you can ask the model what you what it thinks each model each word uh, can be mapped to. How, how how each word can be mapped to a specific pixel patterns. And then that is where the grounding, what the, you can tell that, that the model is like grounding the words to the image, the, to the images or the pixel patterns. Yeah, the girl, the people, trees. So it's working pretty well, actually. 
I mean, this is the the good examples. Obviously, there are bad examples, but at least when it works, it works pretty okay. Yeah, this is a bad example. So a large white bird standing on the forest. So, you know, the, these are two, I think they are two giraffes, but kind of looks like a bird flapping its wings. So there's like, like these two are kind of like, look like a, like a wings. So maybe that's why the model got confused. And a woman holding a clock in her hand. Like it thought, the model thought that this was a clock. And it kind of looks like a clock. There's like a circle here with some uh, words here. So kind of looks like a clock. And a man wearing a hat and a hat on a skateboard. So the model thought this was a skateboard. It didn't show, the, so the picture doesn't show the entire body of the violin. So probably that's why. And it, skateboard are usually, you know, they have like a very glossy uh, wooden, wooden, you know, like texture. So maybe that's why. Mm -hmm. Thought this was a surfboard. Uh, the model thought this was a pizza, but it's not a pizza, but it kind of looks like a pizza. If you look at it from a very far, far apart, kind of looks like a square, square pizza. And a man talking on his cell phone with an, while another man watches. So, yeah, the model thought this was a cell phone. Kind of like it's kind of it's like a block, you know. So it actually it probably is a sandwich, but the model didn't, you know, didn't understand. So that's why. So it doesn't always work, but at least you know how you 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 know that it's making sense. It's not making like terrible mistake. It's kind of like you know like reasonable mistakes. So this was twenty fifteen, and yeah. Showing a throwing of frisbee, so a woman. So they thought the model thought these two are women. A woman is th throwing a frisbee, frisbee here in a park, uh, like like in a park. So you know, you see how it works. All right, we're going to move to a text image. So this was the very first image caption. So hope that everybody knows at least conceptually. And the text to image. So. Last year we talked. I talked about Dali one, but you know that's old news now. So we are going to talk about Dali two. But before we talk about Dali two, we need to touch upon Clip. So Clip is a uh, actually the the we everybody calls this model Clip, but the title of the paper is Learning Transferable Visual Models from Natural Language Supervision. So it's a little bit long. It's a model from OpenAI it's from twenty twenty one, and it's. Clip, the model clip model is learned by doing a contrastive learning between text and image. So it's a multimodal learning. So it's a very simple form of multimodal learning. And so, I mean, all the works that we're going to see today are all like multimodal learning, including the, the image caption generation that we just saw before. So clip is particular, clip in particular is using a contrast learning to learn to perform a multimodal learning. Has great zero shot performance. And it understands the relationship between text and image material. So when I say when the model when when they say that click can do zero shot prediction or zero the zero shot classification, this is what 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 they mean. So given an image, given an image, we can query or we can prompt the model by saying a photo of guacamole, a type of food, a photo of ceviche, a type of food, a photo of edamame, a type of food, a photo of tuna tartar, a type of food, or food, a photo of hummus, a type of food. So you can see that only this part, this part is changing. So this is the variable part. And the other part, the other part is actually just a, a template. So what we do is we want to see if the model knows what type of food this, in, this image contains. So we put all the different food that we can think of in this variable part, in the variable slot, and then we query the model or we prompt the model to see if it thinks that a particular variable has a higher compatibility with the image than the other variables. So you can see that, especially the, when, when we put guacamole in the slot, the model thinks that it has the highest probability as opposed to other food. So the food thinks that, I mean, the model thinks that it also has kind of a, like a very minus, minuscule like, uh, compatibility with the word ceviche, but not more, not not as much as guacamole. So it thinks that out of one hundred, out of out of one hundred one labels. So it means that the the user actually queried the model with one hundred one different types of foods, and out of all that, guacamole ranked one. So and it is it actually guacamole? I think so. I think this is the guacamole. This is like the avocado part. I'm not sure what this is though. And uh, the important thing is. The model was never, this clip model was never trained to do a classification task. 
So basically what we do, what we see here is a classification, 101 way, self, kind of like a self mixed classification. But the model has never learned, has never been trained to perform a classification. It had, and also, and obviously, we have never taught the model that this is a guacamole. So this is just a zero shot, you know, zero shot experiment. And the same thing happens here. Given an image, we can ask what kind of room, no, what, what kind of photo this is. So we try a bunch of different variables. A photo of television studio, podium indoor, conference room, lecture room, control room, like all the other like rooms. And the user has queried the model with 397 different rooms or probably like space types, you know. And out of all that, television studio was the first, or at least the clip model thought that this image had the greatest compatibility or the affinity with the word te television studio. So this is how it works. Basically, when you want to do a zero shot prediction, you give an image and then try out different bunch of different prompts and then see which one is the most compatible. It could go the other way around, actually. You can give the image a specific text and then prompt with all different images and see which image has the highest compatibility. So again, like kind of like a, it's not image generation, it's like image, image retrieval. All right. So how does it work? So we start with contrastive learning. So the clip is a contrastive learning between text and image. So we start with what, what, is, uh, what contrast learning is. So contrast learning focuses on positive pairs and negative pairs. So posit we will, in the latent space, the, the objective of this contrast learning is in the latent space, we want the positive pairs to have small distance or should be close to each other and negative pairs in the latent space to be far apart from each other. So for example, here, these two images are positive positive pairs. They're they're the same images conceptually or semantically. I mean, pixel wise, they're pretty pretty much different. There's like background black background here, but there's like grass here. So pixel wise, they're not the same. But at least semantically, when as we under as humans understand them, semantically they're the same, and they are they should be far apart from far apart from this animal, which is echidna, I guess. I guess you can call this echidna. Yeah. So in the latent space or in the feature space, we want the raccoon, two raccoon images, which are conceptually the same thing, to be similar to each other, to be closer to each other, closer to each other. And we want this image to be far apart from this image, which is echidna, which is conceptually different. So we want this distance to be larger. And you, can, you see that they are all transformed to the latent embedding using the same function with the same parameters. So it's all theta, theta, theta. So it means that we're using one function to map these raw images into the latent space. And in that latent space, we want these two to be closer to each other and these two to be far apart from each other. And obviously these two should be far apart from each other as well. So that's what we want. We want a latent space that respects our conceptual understanding of, of images. And yeah, we want to learn an embedding space that respects such property. So that's basically it. So how do we do this? So there are a lot of different ways to learn to inject this kind of behavior where we want positive to positive pairs to be close to each other, negative pairs to be far apart from each other. We can use many different types of losses. Like there's triplet loss, a lot of like different types of losses to inject this to enforce this kind of behavior to the embedding space. But the most widely used, one of the wi most widely used uh, losses is info and C loss. So it's basically you can if you look at this kind of looks like a like a like a softmax uh, loss or actually a softmax conversion. When, when you know when we when you think about when we were doing attention model we put uh, the low we put the scores into the softmax to get the uh, the the attention distribution right. So it's kind of like that that softmax basically. And uh, what we want to do is we want these positive and positive pairs to be close to each other and the negative pairs to be far apart from each other. So there's this part. So actually in contrast learning, we call this the center image an anchor. This is an anchor. And this is the positive image. And this is the negative image. So we want the anchor and the positive pair to be close to each other. So that's here. So this is an anchor embedding, embedding of the anchor. And this is the embedding of the positive pair. And again, this is the anchor. And this is all the other samples. So we want the... We want the the compatibility or the or the affinity between these two, these two, these anchor and positive pairs, to be higher 
to be higher than all the other compatibilities between, I mean, or to, so more technically, compatibility between all the other, all the other pairs, all the other like negative pairs. So that's basically why we, why we use softmax softmax type of loss here. And you see that we're doing a inner product between the anchor representation vector and the positive representation vector. But that this is not the only way. This is not the only way to uh, de define a distance. Ba basically, what we what we want is the distance function. And here we used inner product to as, as a form of distance function. But this is not the only way to do it. You can actually use actual dist distance, like L2 distance, L1 distance, whatever distance you want. Or you can actually use cosine similarity instead of inner product. There are all, a lot of different ways to do it. But typically, people use inner product or cos cosine similarity, similarity, either of these two. Question. How can researchers decide negativeness, for example, in the slide? Is bulldog the case of negative? Good question. And the answer was, it's actually just another image sample from the same mini batch. So it may suffer from false negatives. Since two different images may share similar similar. Exactly, very, 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 very precisely correct. So we don't know whether, so because we randomly, you can see that here, K0 to N, which is the N is supposed to be the entire image, but we can't do this. So N is actually the size of the mini batch. And it means that we go through all the samples in the mini batch. So there could be, conceptually sem semantically similar samples in the mini batch just such as like us what, what is this like this is german shepherd and there's there could be a bulldog or like golden retrievers or chihuahuas who knows but we just you know we just bear with it because there should be other images like cats and cats people monkeys cars trucks bicycles the probability the chances are that there are images that are not semantically the same way more times than false negatives in your mini batch. So we just bear with it. And typically how we generate a positive sample is we just, you know, uh, do a augmentation. So here, the this is the anchor. And what we did is, what we did to create the positive pair is just black and white. So we just grayscaled it. Or we can distort it a little bit, put a little Gaussian noise on it, or maybe darken the, the brightness or or maybe clip it, right? Only only clip this part and then give it as a positive. Like there, so the signal between the positive pairs are way way stronger than false neg than a signal between a anchor and a false negative, such as bulldog. So we eventually, eventually, we it's okay. Can you guarantee monotonicity about embedding distance in the similarity? I guess there can be a few exceptions. Doesn't matter. You want some answer. <laughs> you demand an answer. What is the reference to know whether conscious learning was conducted well? You can actually do like there's like a lot of different ways to evaluate uh, to confirm to conduct evaluation. You can actually do this kind of stuff here. So this is basically a retrieval uh, retrieval uh, experiment. So you can give a quarry image and then retrieve search for the closest text or the other way you can give a text as a query and then search for the closest image and then you can see whether it makes sense you know so you when if you have a if you already have a labeled example then you can actually evaluate the performance of the retrieval using like f1 score or like ndcg score that kind of stuff so that's how that's one way to evaluate whether the, the whether this underlying feature space respects the 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 distance between positive pairs and negative pairs, but it, it there. I don't think there's a guarantee because again, even during the even during the the training process, there's no guarantee that there would be occasional false negatives. All right. So we've uh, since already learned uh, info and C, the contrasted loss. We'll get to the clip training. So clip training. So here, what we did is contrast learning in the image only. It's image only contrast learning. There's the, the anchor is an image, the positive is image, the negative image, it's all image, right? It's basically you're learning the embedding space or the latent space for embedding images. But here in clip, we're using two modalities, which is image and text. So, and we use cosine similarity instead of, instead of, instead of uh, inner product. So actually we need to normalize these two vectors into a, a unit, unit norm and then and then conduct inner product. So that's how we get cosine similarity. It conceptually it works better because if you have different sized vectors, if you have like this vector really large, this vector really large, it's re easier to get them 
get their like inner product really small or really large. So, and the model is is kind of like prone to cheating away uh, instead of actually learning this true semantics. So we actually use cosine similarity instead of the inner product. And here the, in the clip training, the text encoder part, there are two, there should be two encoders because there's text and image. There are two modalities. So there's two encoder, there are two encoders. There's text encoder and image encoder. And text for text encoder, we use BERT like model, just basically a layer, like multi layers of transformer. For image encoder, you could use CNN, obviously, but here we use vision, something called vision transformer. So everybody these days use transformer to encode images. And not a lot of people use CNN, but conceptually you can use whatever you want. You know, it could be text encoder, it could be some other model, image encoder, it could be some other model. As long as you can encode text and image and then represent them as a fixed sized vectors, then it's okay. So here there's text encoder. So obviously given the text, so actually you can see that actually this is a, a batch, a mini batch of text. And this is also a mini batch of images. So there are one, two, three, four, yeah, like, well, actually, yeah, many, many different text and images. And you should know that they are paired. So you need to, in order to con conduct a clip training, you need to procure a data set where you, have a, where you have a paired text and image. So kind of like a, you know, a caption, caption, a caption data set. And for the paired text and image, you put the text, text part, you put the text into text encoder, you put the image to the image encoder, and then you will have a fixed size vector but there will be multiple vectors for it from because there are multiple multiple instances in your mini batch. So if your mini batch is like size n, then you will have n vectors, n vectors out of your text encoder and n vectors out of your image encoders, right? And with that, with that, what we do is we want the paired, we want the true pairs to have a higher higher probability, and we want all the other pairs, which will be the negative pairs, to have lower probability. So that's basically it. So we just do a, a outer product between these images and these images, you know, do an out, outer product, and then you'll get, sorry, th these text ve vectors and these image vectors, do an, out, do an outer product, and you'll get a inner product, you'll get a, a, a um, you'll get a matrix like this, basically. And the diagonal part is the one that you're interested in. These are the diagonal parts are the positive pairs, and the non-diagonal are the negative pairs, obviously. And we want the diagonal part to have high affinity. And you want the negative non-diagonal part to have lower affinity. Very clear, right? So if you look at the uh, the if if you look at the implementation of clip, it's very, very simple. It's like only, I don't know, like 10 lines of code or something. Because all you need to do is get the text raw text into the text in encoder, uh, raw images to the image encoder normalize the output because we want to do a cosine similarity, normalize the output, and then do an outer product, get the gate the matrix, and then you take only the diagonal part and you want them to be, have a higher probability and you want all the other to be a lower probability and that's it. So once you've trained it, once you've trained it, the way you perform the zero shot prediction as in the, as in the example here, here, as in the example here, you simply put a image, the core image. So what we are going to do is we are going to do an image classification. So we put a fixed image into the image encoder, and then you'll get a normalized image vector here. And then you need the classes. So the classes are generated as a, a, a in, in using a template, a photo of a something. So it could be a plane, car, dog, whatever. So there could be like 100 different or maybe even 1,000 different entities or classes in your in your candidate of classes. So you put a photo of a, dog, a photo of a plane, a photo of a car, a photo of a dog, a photo of a bird into the text encoder. Then you'll have maybe if this was if this was like n number of classes, then you'll have n number of vectors, right? Normalized vectors. So what you do is simply just do a cosine similar inner product between normalized vectors or just a cosine similarity. So there's vectors here and one vector here, and then you just do a inner cosine similarity, cosine similarity, cosine similarity, cosine similarity, cosine similarity, and calculate. And taking all the cosine similarity vectors or distribution of cosine similarities, and you just take the one with the highest cosine similarity, and that's it. So you just pick the one, you just pick the one with the highest compatibility. And happens to be, I don't know what this is. Looks like a dog, right? So it should be like a, a dog, a photo of a dog. That's it. So the 
in, in, or, in order to perform this kind of zero shot prediction, you, you need to define the classes. So it's not, it's not like, you know, true class, true zero shot prediction because like you need to prepare a vocab. Maybe you can prepare like all the nouns in your in English dictionary, but then the chances are it won't be very, it won't be very accurate. So you need to narrow down the candidate, but at least the important thing is the clip train, if you look at the clip training, it's all just contrastive learning. It has never learned to do any classification or prediction, none, none of that. Just by looking at all like millions of millions of millions of different pairs of text and image, image, te image, ca image text pairs, it has learned to ground the words with pixel patterns, just like we saw in the show attendant code. The grounding is happening on in the latent space. And using that grounding, we can do this kind of like zero shot prediction or zero shot classification. Right, so that was it. And one thing that we forgot to mention is vision transformer. So as I said, you can you can you know you can construct your own clip using different kinds of like you know uh, text encoder and image encoder. But we talked about vision transformer, we, which we haven't cut, which we haven't covered in the class today. So we'll in classes so far. So just a brief detour on br vision transformer. So vision transformer came out in 2021, and the title of the paper is pretty attractive. It's an image is worth 16 by 16 words and transformer for image recognition at scale. So this work, the vision transformer, or we call it VIT, vision transformer, is the first image classification model without using any convolutional, convolution CNN components. So no convolution at all. There were some other works that combined attention with convolution for image, image classification, but this work, zero, zero CNN. And it performed, it showed comparable performance to the most powerful CNN at that time. So, I mean, obviously it would be way, way more inefficient because as I said, transform has no bias. CNN has a lot of inductive bias. So if you're doing image classification, CNN is way more efficient way to do it. But if you put a lot of, basically infinite amount of data, then transformer will sooner or later out, outperform CNN at some point. Right, so the... Architecture is just super, super simple. It's just transformer. So if you, I hope that everybody remembers this. So actually the one that we learned in the class has a different uh, process, a different step. I mean, different, like these two have different places. So we start with the multi-head attention, then normalize and add. MLP, then normalize and add. But I guess these days, like starting from this, starting from like 2021 or maybe like 2020, people realize that putting normalization first is like a more beneficial before. So you normalize first before the attention and nor normalize first before the MLP. But the residual connections are still there, right? So, but basically it's the same thing. Just It's a, just a transformer encoder model. So there in the transformer, there's the encoder and decoder part, right? So this is the encoder part. You can think of them as like birds. You know? So what we do is you can see here, basically we just cut the image into grids, into patches. So if you have... 256 by 256 images, and you cut them with 16 to 16 by 16 patches, then you will get 256 patches. So for example, here, if you have 256 by 256 image and you cut them where each patch, each patch has 16 by 16 pixels, then you will have, you will have 16, 16 patches and 16 patches here. So there will be 16 patches horizontally and 16 patches like horizontally and vertically. So if you multiply them, then if you multiply them, then you will get 256 patches. So it's a little bit confusing because there's like the patches 16 by 16, but and also the number of patches are 16 by 16. So a little bit confusing, but if you have 256 by 256 resolution and you cut them by, by the 16 by 16, resolution patch, then you will get 256 patches out, out of out of the entire raw image. So you have, and then out of using 256 patches, where each patch has 16 by 16 resolution, you linearly project them. Basically, you just put this into a linear projection, W, X plus B, which is output Y. And you take, take this Y here, and then you add this with the positional encoding, and then you put them into the 12, 12 layers of, I'm sorry, 12, layer, 12 layers of transformer encoder. And 
this is the CLS token, kind of like in the bird token, in the bird. So this is a CLS token. You take the CLS token and then you multiply and you put them through a softmax classifier and that's it. So very, very simple, right? There's no CNN, there's no nothing. And actually you might think that you should, it's, you should do something with the with the uh, the raw pixels, but the way they do it is just they just cut them into patches and then just linearly transform them into a vector, a vector like two fifty six or maybe if you think of a bird, then it should have seven hundred sixty eight. Is it seven eighty six seven something seven something seven seven something dimension and then put them into the transformer and that's it. Very very simple. And if you put humongous amount of data for training, then it'll start working as a image image classifier model. Right, so yeah, cut an image into grids and linearly transform each patch and add position embeddings to the patch and then feed them into transforming code and that's it, yeah. And uh, hidden sizes, well, okay, yeah, it's 1280, so 30, oh, it, they use 32 layers, so way larger than birth. 32 layers, uh, 12, what, 1280 hidden size and 16 attention has total 600 million, 600 million parameters. And um, when they were releasing this paper, um, they train this model on their internal, the Google train their mo train this model on their internal data set called JFT, which is not public, but it consists of, I don't know, like trillions of images, who knows how many, and just, just gigantic amount of image. And then at that time, it was able to show comparable performance to the most powerful CNN. But if you, if you can, if you imagine the most powerful CNN probably doesn't require that much amount of data and uses way less number of parameters. So you, you, you can think about the trade-off between the two. Right, so when they do a image classification, they can use, they can study the attention pattern, just like how we studied attention patterns in the in the very first transform model, right? The, the, the animal was crossing the street, that kind of stuff. So here we can see which part of the image or which patch basically, which patch the model was most attending to when classifying. So for classifying a dog, it, the patches was like the patches that were getting the attention were, were like these and for an airplane like this and i think this is a snake but it's like an incorrect example so they just they just show two correct examples and one incorrect example so right but the gist of it is that you can study their attention patterns and see if they are making sense or not so this is it so this is vit very simple right you just put 32 layers, so sorry about 32, 32 layers of transforming encoder and then just you just backprop using negative log like or softmax, I mean softmax based neg negative log likelihood loss and that's it. You just train it for like days and days and days and that's it. Well, I, actually these days, I don't think anybody actually trains VIT. They just take VIT from uh, OpenAI's clip uh, encoder. I mean, so clip image encoder because OpenAI, as I said, OpenAI uses VIT for image encoder and transform for text encoder. So they, and I think they, I'm not, I'm not sure if they do or stable diffusion do, but there's like an open source version of a clip. And then that clip comes with trans, uh, pre-trained transformer and pre-trained vision transformer. So you can just take this vision transformer for your purposes. So I don't think anybody actually trains VIT these days. Right, so moving on to the DALI 2 then. So the way we, covered clip and vision transformer to arrive at DALI2. So DALI2 actually, it's not, I mean, everybody knows DALI2 is a diffusion model, but the, the technical details are a little bit important. They use clip priors and classifier free guided diffusion. So here we see the clip being used as a prior. So we'll get to what, we'll get to what it means. And it uh, involves two step up sampling. So they, which are also diffusion. So. Uh, the image quality, I mean, everybody knows like DALI 2 has phenomenal image quality. And actually about a month ago or two, about a month or two ago, DALI 3 came out. So probably it uses the same architecture as DALI 2, or maybe a little bit larger architecture with la larger data set. But basically the, the, the core philosophy probably will be the same. So a corgi's head depicted as an explosion of a nebula. Yeah, I don't think anybody can draw this like, in the entire humanity, maybe like 0.0001% can draw this. So already like Dali2 is like one of the most capable painters out there. It actually, yeah, it draws better than, definitely better than I do. So what do I mean by, what What do they mean by clip prior? So you let's look at the step-by-step -step first, how it generate, how a clip, how Dali2 
generates an image. So there are five steps. One, two, three, four, five. Actually, let's go back to the right line. One, two, three, four, five. So step one, the input is your text input, which will be like this corgi's head or a dolphin in astronaut, whatever, some, some text input. And then the output will be clip text embedding. So that's because we are using clip text encoder. The We go all the way back here. This one. So we're in DALI 2. They use pre-trained, already trained, the clip trained text encoder and clip trained image encoder. I mean, they don't use the image encoder, but they use it as another, I mean, yeah, we'll stick to text encoder. So there's, we already assume that there's already a clip trained text encoder, which is basically like a bird. And then we use that in step one, we use it in step one. So step one, we put the text into that clip text encoder and then we get the clip text embedding. So here, this is the clip text encoder and we get the clip text uh, embedding. And then step two, we take that clip text embedding as an input and then we want a clip image embedding out. So we need to somehow generate from this clip text embedding to the paired clip text as clip image embedding. We'll get to we'll get to see how we do it. And then number three, we take the generated clip image embedding and then generate, we use that as an input and then try to generate raw image of 64 by 64 pixels. So that's the first step. So here, this is the diffusion part. And then there are two upsam two upsampling steps, 64 to 60, 64, 64 to 256, 256, 256 to 124, 1024, 1024. So these two we're gonna skip, but at least one, two, three, this is important. So they use a pre-trained clip which comes with an image encoder and a text encoder. So they're already trained with the clip objective function, the contrast, contrast of learning. So this part is that part, right? So there's text encoder, image encoder. And what we want to do is given a clip text embedding, so we're talking about step two, we're talking about step two, where we use, where we're given a clip text embedding, we need to somehow find a clip image embedding. In step two, we could either find the most compatible image embedding in your images, image pool, because when you were training clip, you, you already had a bunch of text, bunch of text, bunch of text, and bunch of images, paired images, right? And then you can find, given an image, given a text, you can find the most compatible image from your image pool, but that wouldn't be image generation. That would be image searching or image retrieval. We want to generate a synthetic, completely new images. So we can't do this. Finding the most compatible image embedding using your image encoder, clip trained image encoder, finding the most compatible image embedding is just as, it's the same as zero shot prediction from the clip. This wouldn't be a generation. We need to generate, we need to generate the most compatible image embedding. So how we do it is, number one, we can either generate a compatible image clip Im image embedding using autoregressive model or another diffusion. So there's autoregression and CFG diffusion. So given a image, sorry, given a clip text embedding, which is given to us, we want to generate a compatible clip image embedding. The way we do it is we can generate by using a transform-based autoregressive model where we predict one dimension at a time. So this, then this, then this, then this, then this, then this, 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 this. Autoregressively, we can generate this image. We can generate this, this image embedding. Or we can use another classifier-free guided diffusion starting from here to here. So they tried both ways. The, the OpenAI researchers tried both, both methods, autoregression and CFT diffusion. Performance was, the performances were comparable between the two, but in the end, Open just went with the letter, the, the, the CFG diffusion. So if you think about it, in here, this part is this part. Step two uses CFG diffusion. This part also uses CFG diffusion, CFG diffusion. So it's actually just a sequence of diffusion or hierarchical diffusion. DALI 2 uses two diffusion steps, one with the from starting from here to here, and then and then given a clip image embedding that which we just generated just now, right? Just now, which we generated, 
Given using that as an input, we do another classifier free guided diffusion to generate the actual raw image, actual raw image, which is 64 by 64. So that's how DALI 2 works. So some people might wonder, why not go from directly from here to here? Why not just you know, directly use the image and the clip text embedding as, an, as, a, as a class or as a condition, and then just use CFG diffusion, classifier free guided diffusion, to generate image directly? Why not do that? We could do that. We could do that. Technically, we can do that. It's just that having one more step in between, just going from image clip, clip image, I'm sorry, clip text embedding to clip image embedding, then using that image embedding to go to the raw image, that works way better. But technically, you can you can try to go from here to here directly using just one diffusion step instead of using two diffusion steps. It's just that two diffusion steps works better. You know, higher image quality, more diversity, and you know, like what yada yada yada. So yeah, OpenAI researchers did a lot of different things, and th this is this this is the one that they arrived at. So we could probably give them like we can trust that trust why they did this. Question. Is it more efficient to train this way? Do we know why it is better? No, it's just empirically it's better. Or you can just assume that because Clip has a such a good compatibility, the Clip model has such a great understanding between text and image, and at least this has come. This is on comes from the image encoder side. This comes from the text encoder side. So starting from the image encoder side to the go going to the image might work a little bit better than starting from the text embedding to going to the image directly. It's just my my just you know my way of taking this information or interpreting this inter information. Right. Hopefully that makes sense. Right, so any questions so far? All right. So I'm not yeah, we're uh what what are step four, four and five? Step four and five are upsampling. We we'll just take this generated image and to and then upsample it to two fifty six two fifty six. And step five is taking that generated two fifty six to going to ten twenty four ten twenty four. Just high resolution. So if you're interested in the upsampling, you can you know like search search in the internet. There are a lot of diff, a lot of examples of upsampling. So you can you know search on your own time. Right, so if you think about the difference between latent DDPM that we covered last week and diffusion, it's a little bit different, right? They're, so they're both they're both conditional models. So you can see the conditioning coming here, right? So the free text the, the free text embedding is the text embedding. So this you can see that you, you can assume that this is like a clip text embedder, like clip text clip text encoder. So clip text encoder gets the text in and then use that as a condition or as a classifier free guided diffusion condition, right? But the important thing is DALI 2 generates the image embedding first and then based on that image embedding generates 64 by 64, right? In latent, latent DDPM or latent diffusion, based on that, based on the image, oh, sorry, sorry, based on the text embedding, they directly generate the auto encoder, like the latent, latent embedding Actually, yeah, I guess it's the same. Like, so a little bit tricky, but in Dal in Dali two, you go from you go you start from the text embedding and then arrive at an image embedding. Which image embedding you use to go to the sixty four by sixty four? Same deal here. You start from the text embedding and then generate image embedding. But that image embedding is actually learned from an auto encoder. So you go up sample here. So you can see the difference between the two, right? I mean, this is also upsampling, probably. Like, if this is two fifty six and this is sixty four by sixty four, then sixty four by sixty four, then this is larger, right? So this is also upsampling. But the way that, but the the latent the, the property of the latent space is different. So the latent space here, here is based on clip. The latent space here, or actually the latent space between here and here, is based on autoencoder. So that's the difference. Hopefully everybody understands, right? All right, so I think next is the quiz. Yeah, so quiz one. So please read and then uh, uh, give me the answer in uh, in private message. And I've already said that in the classroom, I won't take 
your answer is if you don't have your student number, if you don't follow the spec, just give me the number, comma separated, no blanks, right? You've seen the class and post. Any other answer form, I'm not going to, I'm not going to count them. And uh, we'll stop at uh, when? Yeah, stop at 28, 11, 28. Or actually 27, 9, 59. Remember, private message, number only, comma separated, no blanks, and your student number should be there. All right, 10 seconds. All right, so the answer is number one and one only actually. The others are all false. So and I, I've said multiple times that you can replace the image encoder and text encoder with any other encoders. It, it'll, it'll still work in clip, right? So this is obviously for it. And you, using clip, you can't generate new images. You can only look for images. So it's a retrieval machine or a search machine. It's not a generation model. And number four, VIT needs multiple transformer layers. No. So we talked about the self attention. It using the own using even using only one encoder layer. The patch. We can go from. We can go all the way back here. Even with a single self attention layer. This image, this patch can attend to this patch, this patch, this patch, this patch, this, 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 this because of self attention. So it doesn't require like CNN to go all the way up to the to the to the to all the way up the layers to get a high receptive field. Actually, it has global receptive field even from the layer one. So, well, actually, that makes the training a little bit difficult. But still, that's the property of of, of transformers. And latent DDPM and Dolly two both rely on contrast learning. No, DDPM. I mean, latent DDPM. Doesn't have anything anything to do with contrast learning, right? So obviously, number the the number one choice option one is the only answer. You don't have so many parameters in transform layer. Transform. What I'm not sure what you're talking about. The actual VIT uses thirty two layers doesn't use one what i'm saying is using only even using with only one layer the the patches can attend to all the other patches so it has a global receptive field all right moving on to image text multimodal pre-training so i don't have a, so I, I don't have a lot of time so i'm going to have to skip this in a very like we're going to scheme this so there the, the multimodal pre-training was a big thing in late 29 and early 2020 using BERT-like models. So there's all different variations like video BERT, VILBERT, InterBERT, LXBERT, UNITER, UNITED, UNIFIED, VLP, PIXELBERT, COCA, Fleming. Well, Fleming was actually a generative model, so it's kind of a little bit different. And BAIT, so all different kinds of flavors. The objective is the same. Pre-train a model using like mass language modeling, like BERT style, to understand the relationship between images and text. So it's kind of like a little bit more sophisticated pre-training than CLIP. Clip is very simple. It's just contrastive learning. But 
in these models, in these models, they use conscious learning, mask language modeling, image reconstruction, all kinds of different tasks to enforce the understanding between images and text with a single unified model. And the downstream task could be like image retrieval, visual question answering, image captioning, image generation. But the important thing is you need to fine tune your pre-trained model for each new task because this is still BERT-based model. So BERT, you need to fine tune them for specific tasks, right? It's the same thing with these all these pre-trained models. You need to fine tune them for each task, which is a little bit more inconvenient compared to what we can do with GPT-4 Vision. So the common strategy is to extract images, image features from the image. So you can either use pre-trained object detectors like FEST RCNN or MASK RCNN to, gen to extract bounding boxes and then only input those bounding boxes into the model. Or you can directly feed pixel feature maps or use VQV. We haven't talked about VQVA, so I'm going to skip that. And so feed, you feed those image features and text to a bird, like a large bird, and then optimize for some pre-training objectives like mask language modeling, mask image prediction, image text alignment, which is kind of like contrastive learning. So uh, there are a lot of different stuff. There's like, I think Vilbert is one of the most, one of the very, very first BERT-based multimodal pre-training model between actually video and text, not in a single image, but like a frame, multiple image frames and text to align between the two. They use... Mask image modeling, mask language modeling, image image text alignment. So what? How they? How can you? I mean, mask language modeling is pretty simple. You just, you know, you just mask out certain percentage of your input and then try to reconstruct it. But how can you do mask image modeling? Because images are pixels, so you can't. There is nothing. You can't do a softmax classification. So the way they did it is they actually use object detection model off the shelf and then put it on the image frame. And then generate and then generate the bound, bounding boxes and take those bounding boxes and each bounding box will have each bounding box will have a class attached to it because they are doing object detection. So they use that class as a target for target for image mask image modeling, and then there's image text alignment prediction, which is using these two class CLS tokens from the image and text. They do an inner product or cosine similarity to see. To see if they are from the state, if they are paired or not, because sometimes you intentionally put unpaired, unmatching image and text, and then set their set the set the cosine similarity value to be zero. And for the matching pairs, they set the image cosine cosine similarity value to be one. So they use a contrastive learning as well. So there are different var variations like LXBERT, VLBERT, Uniter, PixelBERT. Coca, but I'm going to skip them. We don't have a lot of time, actually. But yeah, if you can look it up on their own time, but their basic idea is all the same. They have a just gigantic bird-like transformer, and then they just put image in the one side, image in the one, image in the one side, text in the other side, and then they just do some kind of mass language modeling, contrast learning, use multiple different losses, and then hope that the model figures out the relationship between text and image, and then evaluate them on multiple different downstream tasks where you need to fine tune the model for each task, which is a little bit cumbersome. All right, so now we go to Vision LLM. So before we go to Vision LLM, we need to talk about Llama, Alpaca, Lava in that order. So hopefully everybody at least heard about Llama and Llama too. So Llama is a pre-trained language model released by Meta. So I think it's a large language model Meta, yeah, I'm not really sure. They, they have an abbreviation. Anyway, so Llama was released. Well, it wasn't released. It wasn't. It was never publicly released. They just received requests from like researchers that they wanted, like, and they thought, and if the and the, if the request was legitimate, then Meta would send the Llama the checkpoint. But somebody leaked it on online, and then now everybody has access to Llama. So officially, it was announced in February this year. So last February, the model sizes came in different sizes. So, so there's 7 billion, 13 billion, 33 billion, 65 billion. So they released four different model sizes. And context length was 2048. And it was trained on 1 trillion tokens or 1.4. So a 7B model was trained on 1 trillion tokens. 65B model was trained on 1.4 trillion tokens. So if you think about G it's exactly like GPT-3. It was trained only to predict the next token 
using a very large model. So 7B probably consists of how many? Like, I don't know, like 48 layers, maybe 60 layers, 65 billion, probably like some some dozens of layers, you know. So the context length is 20, 10, 20, 2084, uh, 2040. And training data consists of text from only 20 languages, 20 most spoken languages, which are Latin and Cyrillic alphabets. So Lama actually, Lama 1, cannot handle like Japanese or Korean or Chinese because the 20 languages all come from Latin based or Cyrillic based, like Russian, Ukraine, or, uh, Ukrainian, or English, French, German, like that kind of stuff. So that was Lama. And Lama 2 came out some months later, last July. So they're very serious. So Meta is very serious about it. They're, they announced that they will release Lama 3 very soon. So we'll actually see that happen pretty soon. And this time, the models, the only three model sizes came out 7B, 13B, 70B. Context length has doubled. And the training data has increased like by 40%, like 2 trillion tokens. And interestingly, from Llama 2, Meta has allowed commercial uses. So Llama 1 was only research only, but Llama 2, you can use it. You can fine tune Llama 2 and then use to make money. You can run your business or whatever. So, which is completely different from many other open source models. Like, you know, uh, actually, I don't know how many open source models there are. And the one other, another thing is, they released Llama 2, the vanilla version, which is exactly the same as GPT-3, which is just basically next token prediction model. But they released another version, which is Chet fine-tuned model. So there's Llama 2 Chet, actually. And the Llama 2 Chet was fine-tuned on 100K Chet examples. And uh, it underwent RLHF, RLHF using 1 million human preferences. So it was, was fine-tuned pretty heavily. Question from... If LM could be integrated into an edge device, what possible application could arise? Actually, that's yeah, that you can ask them on class and I need to run through the run, to, run through the end because I need to leave at exactly 12, 12, 12, 12 o'clock today. Yeah, we have quiz to cover. Please ask them ask them again, ask your question again on class. Then. So fine-tuning LLM. So as I said, Llama itself is just Vanilla GPT-3 can't speak, can't understand. It's not even like instruct GPT. It can't take your instruction. It's nothing, right? Llama is nothing. It's just predict. It just predicts your next next token. So you can like you can do like zero shot tasks, like you know, like well, with the like uh, the games that we played in GPT-3. You can do that with Llama, but it cannot understand your command and then execute it. So in order to make that happen, Stanford researchers actually came up with a very neat strategy. Actually, it it. The strategy came from a similar strategy was proposed in a paper called Self-Instruct. Actually, I, I forgot. To, there's another paper called Self-Instruct, which used GPT, ChatGPT to... Well, actually, let's talk about Alpaca first. So what the, what the Stanford people did is they... So Alpaca is the first fine-tuned open source LLM using less than $600. Ideally, if you knew what you were doing, you could use, you could use $600 only to get your own working... Chat LLM, or not actually not chat LLM, it's instruction LLM. The way they did it is they first generate instruction following examples from Text Da Vinci 003. So I think this is the old form of chat GPT or whatever. And then use those examples to find to Lama. So it's a two-step process. So, so here you can see that using a powerful LLM, which can already take your instructions, you feed. 107, so you feed some seed, seeds instruction following, instruction following examples here, for example, here. These instruction, brainstorm a list of possible New Year's, Year's resolution. Then this model will take this instruction in and then output the out outcome. So lose weight, exercise more, uh, eat healthier. So, and uh, these, so you, you actually, you need to have some seed examples like instruction. So, so seed, seed uh, there are, how many seeds? There are 175 seeds. So seed would look like this. So instruction, yada, yada, yada. And then input, instruction, input, output, output, output. So instruction is like read the, or, or uh, what? Read the input, read the input, and then convert it into French or whatever, like read the English input, English input, and then translate it into French. And then there would be English words here, English words here, and then like French words here. So you need to prepare this uh, seed samples, at least like in the, 
in this llama in the alpaca example, they took 175 self-instruct C tests, which actually come from this paper, self-instruct paper. So self-instruct paper, actually they did the same thing. They extracted in, instruction following samples from a powerful model and then fine-tuned it on GPT-3, the vanilla GPT-3. But here, what the Stanford people did is they, they took the instructions, they extracted instructions from the powerful LLM, ChatGPT, and then used it to fine-tune Llama, not GPT-3, Llama. And then Llama started to take instructions and then you know, understand your command and follow your command. So that's basically, it's very, very, on a high level, it's very simple. It's, to, it's mainly just engineering work, actually, that, that, that you need to care about. So, so get the best outcome possible. High level philosophy, high level principles are pretty straightforward. Yeah, I'll, actually, I did prepare self-instruct. So self-instruct was the, the, the first paper that actually um, kind of like demonstrated how you can extract or use a powerful LLM like ChatGPT to extract or generate many, many uh, instruction following samples so that you can use it for fine tuning another weaker LLM. So you have seed tasks and then you put them into a pool and then you generate instruct you instruct generations using a powerful LLM. And then using that instruction, you well, they have some kind of like uh, uh, like uh, they have another step where you where they think with where where they were the researchers of self-instruct paper. They thought it was important to classify or distinguish between instructions that are more classification-like or not classification-like. So if the test, if the instruction is classification-like, then if it is yes, then they generate output first. If it is not classification-like, they generate uh, they generate the, uh, the uh, they generate the input first. So there's input output. So they, if it is classification-like, they generate output first. If it's not classification-like, they generate input first. But um, in the self instruction I'm sorry, in the alpaca, they don't use it anymore. They just put the seed in and then they just, you know, uh, enforce the model to generate very similar examples like the seeds. And then they just put it into, put, put it into a pool using some simple filtering procedures. Like if their blue score is, if the output from the, the from the language model is like very similar to, to the ones already in the pool, they just discard it and they just only take the more like new ones so that, so that so you can increase the diversity of the uh, of the task pool. So in Alpaca, they don't use this step, and it still works. Actually, it works better than using this classification step. So you can forget forget about that. So this is the self instruct examples that we I took from the actual self instruct paper. So once you go through, once you have the cycle multiple times, multiple times, and then you will get high quality instruction samples like this. So you can if you look at here. These are all machine generated. So instruction, generate a random password with at least six lit, uh, characters. And then, oh, this is an even like a coding, coding instruction. And target output is like this. And another thing, let's see if there's like, yeah, this one has an input. Given a word, find out its length and its number of vowels. And input word, hello. So these are all machine generated. And the output is length five, number of vowels two. So, so this like set is machine generated. So once you have this, you can take this as a input and then train a, train a model to have this as an output. So then you can, which can, so that, oh, what happened here? Oh, interesting. Oh, not this one. Yeah, somehow my iPad just crashed. Sorry about that. Right. So as I said, you can take these inst instruction input output pairs or sometimes just instruction output pairs and then use it fi to find to Llama and then Llama will start to understand your command and, you know, you know do as you're bidding, basically. Right. And so... Based on that, we'll go to Lava now, Vision LM. So Vision LLM is just like LLM. It's just that it recognizes images. So Lava is the first fine-tuned open source LLM to recognize images. So you can see, you can even have a conversation with it. So, so Lama, sorry, Alpaca, Alpaca, you can't have conversation with Alpaca because all the instruction samples are one shot, one turn things. It's just you command and then you get an output and that's it. You can't have a conversation with 
alpaca, but in lava, you can even have a conversation because they've trained the fine, they fine tuned the model to with the conversation examples. So given a Mona Lisa image, do you know who drew this, who drew this painting? Then it says like a like a famous artwork by Leonardo da Vinci. Given this, do you know who drew this painting? It knows it's a humorous situation. It's a dog, but but uh, it comes from like Da Vinci style, whatever. So it actually understands and then you know understands the image and then have a conversation with you. So how do we train llama? It's very similar to llama actually. So in order to train llama, you need two components. You need a language decoder or like language model, and you need an image encoder. So two things. You need only you need only two things. Llama. So for the language decoder or the language model, you take llama. Or I'm not sure. In the paper, in their lava paper, in their paper, they say they took llama, but in their web page, they say they take they took vicuña. Vicuña is a chat fine tuned llama, basically. It's kind of like a lot, it's kind of like alpaca, but Unlike alpaca, vicuña, you can have conversation, I think. So, but I'm not sure which one they took, but it's the, the, it's the detail. But in, basically, you need a language decoder, a very strong language decoder. And you need a very strong image encoder because you need to you want the model to understand the image. So for the image encoder, they used Clip VIT, Clip Pre-trained Image Encoder. And then all you do is you convert. So there's two stages. So the training, the fine-tuning of Lava consists in two stages. Stage one is pre-training for feature alignment. Stage two is fine-tuning end-to-end. So you can see that pre-training, so in order to align the latent space of the image encoder and the latent space of the language model, you need a projection layer, which is just a single linear projection, that's it. So once your, once your image, image passes through, Pass it through a VIT, it'll have contextualized vectors, right? It'll have contextualized vectors. And you put, you take those vectors, you take those vectors, you take those vectors, and then simply just put it into a language model. But before you do that, maybe your dimensionality of your VIT output and input of language model won't match. Maybe this is 256, but this is like 1024. Or, even without, even even if it, it even if, if their dimensionalities matches, their contents might not match, you know, because this is this comes from VIT and this comes is like a completely differently trained language model, right? So you want them to be aligned a little bit. So you need a projection layer where you just simply take this vector, this vector, take this vector, and then you just w x plus b equals y, and take those y and then put them into a language model, and that's it. Just simple one linear layer and that's it so in stage one all you do is freeze vit freeze language model you don't train them you don't find them you freeze their parameters only train this part only train the projection part using a subset of ccm3 so conceptual caption 3m and stage two is where you actually fine tune the model to take your instructions and then have a conversation that kind of stuff and here in end-to-end, -end, this is where you train or fine-tune both language model and projection projection layer. The vision encoder is always freeze, frozen, regardless, regardless where you're, whether you're in stage one or stage two, they're always frozen. Yeah, so projection matrix, matrix and LM updated for two different scenarios. One is visual chat, one is science QA, but we'll only talk about the visual chat. Stage one, so you use a subset of conceptual captions. So conceptual caption is a simple caption image caption data set collected from the web. So it's not like high quality captions MS Coco because they're all collected from the internet. I mean, they went through some filtering process, but still it's like the captions are rather low quality, very short, like word-based captions. So what they do here in Lava, they filter out conceptual 3M, CC3M to filter out, I'm oh, sorry about, that. give me a second. All right, I'm back. So, <clears throat> yeah, they filter out. Uh, they filter out some, some like uh, a large portion of conceptual captions samples to fil filter out low frequency noun phrases. Like they want to filter out basically. They don't want to deal with like very low frequency, uh, 
rare like image caption pairs. So they just filter a lot of them and then you're left with about 600K pairs. And the training in stage one is very, very simple. It all takes this particular form or slight variation of it. Human provide a brief description of the given image and you have the image tokens coming from the VIT and the assistant insert a C3. So in, assistant, all they do is just copy paste a CC3M caption here and that's it. And sometimes you you switch this command into briefly describe this image or what does this image mean briefly? Like there are different variations basically, but the semantic is the same. Just describe this image brief, uh, concisely or briefly. And they you use CC3M caption, the vanilla caption themselves as the output. And that's it. Then you train the projection matrix only. That's stage one. Stage two is where they actually use high quality samples. So stage two, they use MS Coco, which includes five captions per image. And it also comes with bounding boxes. And they use GPT-4, GPT-4 to generate instruction following samples. And there are three types of instructions. There's conversation, detailed description, complex reasoning, and using GPT-4, they generate 160,000 samples. So this is a example. So what you do to generate image instruction following samples using GPT-4 is you, gen you provide GPT-4 with the caption, all five captions, one, two, three, four, five, all five captions to GPT-4. And you also provide bounding box coordinates, interestingly. So person bounding box coordinate, person bounding box coordinate, person, uh, there's backpack bound, bound, backpack coordinate, backpack coordinate, suit coordinate, because GPT-4, vanilla GPT-4 doesn't understand images. So you need to provide image information in textual form. So they give captions and bounding box coordinates. And then you prompt GPT-4 to generate interesting conversation samples or interesting detailed description samples and whatnot. So the conversation samples look like this. So what type of vehicle is featured in the image? The image features a black SUV. Where is the vehicle parked? Parked in ground underground parking area. What are people doing? They are trying to fill the fit all their luggage into the SUV. So these conversation samples or detailed description samples or complex reasoning, these are generated by GPT-4. So you can imagine a lot of money went into this project because GPT-4 is like way, way more expensive than ChatGPT. So they generated 160,000 samples. I think a half of them were conversation, the quarter, detailed description quarter, like complex reasoning. Using the, oh, this is, oh, sorry, that was quiz two. Okay, so I think this is it. So, so far, any question before we get to the quiz? Basically, this is it. So you have two training two training stages. One is simple alignment using only the projection matrix. Stage two is actually using high quality GPT-4 induced provided uh, instruction following samples to train both here and here, right? And you could imagine the training part is always the answer part. You only, so there's, you put image. So let me, let me get back to the, so this is lava, lava. You put images, image vectors in. So these are the image vectors, Im Im image vectors. Then you put question, put question, and then you want answers to come up, right? Answers to come up. So when you're training, when you're fine tuning Llama to become Lava, you put image here, question here, and then you backprop the answers here, autoregressively, autoregressively. And then in the next, in the next, next answer, in the next phase, what you do is actually need to, for the next chat turn, you put previous answer here, previous answer. So this is Q1, this is A1. Then you put Q2, and then you want the A2, A A2 to come out, right? And then, so question comes, goes in here, answer goes in here, question goes in here, and then you want this answer to come out. So this is where the backprop happened autoregressively. Auto so that's how you train basically Vision LLM. Right. 
so there are some questions. I think I have five more minutes. So we, we can take the quiz too for two minutes. So let me look at the, actually, no, yeah. If there are immediate questions. Uh, from Aldo, was there an attempt to, to make the model say making a bomb instruction like this and bypass this? You could do that. Uh, you could actually do that. I'm not sure if anybody actually did that and then wrote a paper about it because it could be controversial, but you could definitely do that. Question from uh, GPT-4 to 만든 컨텍스에 할루시네이션이 있을 수도 있는데 트레이닝 샘플 할루시네이션이 있을 수도 있는데 그거는 처리할 수가 없죠. 이걸 왜냐면은 이게 지금 십몇만 개를 만들기 때문에 십몇만 개를 다볼 수가 없거든요, 사람이. 그래서 그냥 믿고 가는 겁니다. Why do we need to unfreeze the LLM during fine-tuning lava? Good question, because we want to inject this chatting kind of behavior. So stage one is only trying to like make make those make the embedding space of this and this this compatible basically but then you actually need to train at llama to conduct to 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 understand your instruction and then having have a chat basically because that's what happened in alpaca as well alpaca you fine tune the entire language model to under to make it understand your instruction and then follow your instruction so you must at some point unfreeze llm and then you know, fine tune it that's inevitable I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the researchers actually did some some people some question asked why why just just not do stage two? Why not skip stage one and just go to stage two directly? I guess the researchers who came up with lava probably did that and then it didn't work. So they just slided in this additional stage to make it more, you know, trainable. You could read the paper if you're interested. All right, so I think we are in the final, final quiz of this course. So which of the following is true? I'll give you guys two and a half minutes. So actually, probably not. I can't give you guys like maybe I'll give you guys until 58, 9, 50, yeah, 11, 58, 59. Oh, I forgot. This is a typo. There it should be two. All right, 15 seconds. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, so the answer is number two only. So the others are all wrong. So as I said, bird based models use a lot of different losses, like contrast learning loss and other losses as well. Alpaca, as I said multiple times, Alpaca can only perform one turn instruction. It cannot have chats like Vicuña or Lava. Lama cannot be fine tuned to recognize audio. Actually, it can. You, it can, can be fine tuned to recognize any modality as long as you have the instruction following symbols. Lava can perform object segmentation. No, Lava can only generate text as an output. It cannot meddle with the image content. So the answer is number two only. Right, so this is the end of the entire class, entire course actually, this semester. So hope you guys had a not good time, but at least like educational. I hope you guys got, you know, at least learned something out of this entire course. If this was a very, very difficult for course for me. I think this was this has been the most difficult course I've ever ever I've ever conducted or taught. So good luck with your uh project three, which will be next week. And then, you know. I'll probably con connect you with you guys on class some about you know like after class surveys and whatnot. So I'll I'll talk to you guys on class soon. Yeah, thank you guys and you know good work. It's probably it has not been easy for those who start their machine learning class for the first time. For the first time, it wouldn't have been easy, but you know hopefully you can write mo whatever model you want now. Yeah.
네, 감사합니다. 네, 모두 수고하셨고요. 네, 클라썸으로 다시 또몇 가지 뭐 팔로업을 좀 하겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. 네, 감사합니다. 수고하셨습니다. 감사합니다. 네.